International Women's Day is March 8th. It's a global day celebrating the economic, political, and social achievements of women's past, present, and future. In some places, like China, Russia, Vietnam, and Bulgaria, International Women's Day is a national holiday. Annually, on 8th of March, thousands of, thousands of events are held throughout the world to inspire women and celebrate achievements. A global web of rich and diverse local activity connects women from all around the world, ranging from political rallies, business conferences, government activities, and networking events, to local women selling crafts in markets, theatrical performances, fashion parades, and much more. Here in the United States, the whole month of March is designated as Women's History Month. This year's theme is Make It Happen. So make a difference, think globally, act locally. Make every day International Women's Day. Do your bit to ensure that the future for girls is bright, equal, safe, and rewarding. And remember, make it happen. Now I'd like to call up Joyce McNichols. She's also a co-chair of the Racial Justice Task Force Committee here at the YWCA. Joyce? So you know I'm so loud. I don't even need this microphone, but I'll use it anyway. So we're so excited that um, so many of you came out today. I just want to let you know a little bit about the Racial Justice Task Force and acknowledge our members. So we got started, I believe it was in the fall of 2013, um, and we um, wanted to figure out ways that we could be more visible in the community and um, have events that would build awareness about racial justice, well actually, what we can do to work towards racial justice. And so um, the committee consists of board members, um, folks from the community, and some YWCA staff. So I just want to acknowledge um, some of the members of the task force who are here today. Um, if you could stand up, please, that would be great. I know we have Atel as the co-chair. Atel, Atel is right there, my partner in crime. And Erica, Chantel Bethia was here, but she's had to leave. She's a member of the, Amy Edison is right there. Yeah. Linda, Linda Cavanaugh, obviously, Linda's right there. Well, let me just, let me just, um, in case I've missed anybody, um, I apologize. But I also want to have a special recognition for um, a couple of folks. Women's, Women Together is an organization here in Worcester that first brought this Women, International Women's Day forward um, to our attention. And they were the lead organization last year, and we um, collaborated with them on that, and it was held here. This year, we're taking the lead on it, but we didn't know, we wouldn't have known anything about it if it weren't for Women Together. So, Margot Barnett and um, Nicole Belanger and Karen Ferrero. Yeah. And if I missed anyone from Women Together, I apologize for that. Oh, and I see Imrana Sufi just walking by. See, it's so funny, I forget about Imrana, because Imrana, she, every time I see her, I think food. And I don't necessarily think task force, and why don't, she's on the task force as well. So I really appreciate your help, um, the folks from Women Together that helped us get this off the ground. And I want to acknowledge our co-sponsors um, with the ACLU of Central Massachusetts. Uh, let's see, we have Worcester State University Women's Studies Department, right? Yeah. And we have Women in Action. Okay. And of course, so um, we've been doing a few things since we formed. We were able to be involved in a, um, a, a collaboration with Insight Media, with young people in Worcester. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we had an event with um, that group where they had a film showing, debut film showing, uh, where we had a panel presentation after that. We um, were able to... Um, be involved in a couple of protest marches involving um, immigration rights for young people in the state of Massachusetts. So we're trying to link up with other groups in the community who are doing things of um, mutual interest around our mission at the YW, which is elimination of racism and the empowerment of women. So that's all I want to say. I'll be back up later to introduce my girl, Mariana. <laughs> later, so. Um, 
and as uh, women hosting and sharing this event, we're always full of surprises and a surprise I just received on behalf of the uh, YWCA. It's from the Massachusetts House of Representatives. So I'm reading this with you, all of you, for the first time. From the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the House of Rep Representatives. We hereby know to all the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to the YWCA in recognition of your outstanding to commitment to the empowerment of women and elimination of indiscrimination and racism. It is an honor to join you in the celebration of International Women's Day with Make It Happen. So, thank you. DeLeo, Speaker of the House, and offered by James O'Day, State Representative. Thank you. All right, and to kick things off, uh, as you know, we'll have some workshops that will be spread throughout the building. And we'll have some guides that will show you where the workshops are and you're able to attend all of them. And we have bathrooms that are right out here. Just feel free to get up and use as needed. Before we break off to our workshops, we do have two very short, fun, and entertaining um, pieces of work that we want to share with you. The first is Francesca Abbey. Francesca Abbey has over 44 years experience as a professional band leader and has performed with artists such as Benetu Aluju, Forces of Nature Dance Company, Papa Lajadi Kamara, to name a few. Miss Abbey is proficient in several West African per percussion instruments such as djembe, juju, songa, shakiri, congas, and more. African drumming by the group Velikite is featuring Francesca Abbey. She's here, let's give her a round of applause as she takes the moment. Good afternoon. Am I here alone? Ladies can talk. I think ladies can talk. Good afternoon. Yay! Oh, that's better. Okay, I thought I was here all by myself. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say I can't find the words to begin to describe and express my gratitude for Dr. Joyce McDickles for inviting me to say a few words regarding women's beauty and strength and how it relates to my group, Bellaquete's performance. I'm humbled and honored to be here for this awesome event. Um, as Erica mentioned, uh, my name is Francesca Abbey and uh, I'm the founder and artistic director of my group, Bellaquete named after the female African deity of the marketplace, Aizan Belakete, in the uh, Baudun tradition. And uh, Belakete is an African percussion ensemble that takes its audience on a spiritual journey through the African diaspora through an innovative fusion of African and Caribbean spiritual and social music. Now, um, as Erica had mentioned, I um, have over 44 years, well, really 40, over 40, well, forget it, you know, over 40 something years uh, experience as a professional band leader. I started my first band when I was 15 years old and uh, performed with such artists as Baba Tunde Olatunji, Forces of Nature Dance Company, Papa Laji Kamara from Guinea, West Africa, to name a few. And uh, I play several West African percussion instruments, uh, drums, such as the djembe, the jum jum, the songba, the shekere, and congas, and more. And um, what I wanted to say about African, well, about women, period, and strength and beauty, is that um, many people look at what I do as a djembe fola. Djembe fola is a typical title for a djembe drummer. And they say, that's men's work. You know, that she should be playing those instruments. Go home and cook for your husband. You know, or she's so mannish. 
won't let nobody carry nothing for her, you, you know. Well, that's how I build up the strength to do what I do, you find out. Okay. <laughs> I'm a U.S. Army veteran, and I'm also somebody's grandma. I'm a former bodybuilder and a former model. And um, I'm a martial artist, and as well as an artist who paints, sculpts, draws, and I do creative graphic design as well. And I crochet a little bit. Don't know how to knit yet, for y'all knitters out there, but I can do a little crochet. I'm a well-rounded woman in more ways than one. You're a deity of thunder and lightning. The strength and toughness of Ogun, the male Yoruba deity of iron. The softness and sweetness of Oshun, the female Yoruba deity of sensuality and beauty. And the power and endurance of Shango, the flamboyant male Yoruba deity of fire. And I try to dress my African and womanly best while doing it to impress. I know that my creator, my ancestors and the deities all enjoy what I do and how I deliver it, and I hope you will too. Thank you. Nothing 
So I took this invitation as a personal challenge for myself um, in, in a public demonstration of my racial analysis, observing my own life um, and the intersections and the complexities that come with being a brown Muslim uh, woman. <clears throat> I want to share um, with you um, some of my in intimate um, thought process, which helps to guide me to make deep-seated connections with the larger issues impacting our community. So my inspiration for this comes from an experience um, I had a few weeks ago, where I was invited to come and speak um, at a local youth program, um, specifically around self-esteem self for our high school girls. Um, and so for me, that was a particular challenge because I hadn't been doing, um, you know, direct youth work around um, issues of um, self-esteem specifically. Um, so I really took this uh, this approach where I kind of sat back and said, well, what would I want to know um, then that I know now? And so, yeah, that's like the million dollar question, right? And so I really thought about, um, you know, how we need to have conversations about self-esteem um, in relation to uh, you know, the things that have happened in our world and are happening in our world, that those two conversations cannot happen in silos. Um, and so, you know, in thinking about this, um, you know, I thought about how women are you know, typically misled to believe that um, the only force at work um, is their own self-perception. And however, that limited analysis will not empower women with the tools we need to truly embrace our self-worth. So this sparked some great dialogue at the youth program, and I hope it does here as well um, after um, uh, the speech. So um, <laughs> I'm not a big reader, and I'm sorry to say that because you know reading is fundamental. But I will say that um, when I imagined sharing my story, I favorite um, television programming. I thought about um, how do I make complex ideas really simple to understand and how do I do it so that it really transcends the space and time continuum? That sounds like really you know, out there, right? This is how I think. You're getting some insights into how I think. So again, I thought of my um, favorite shows. Um, so for older folks in the room, I thought about the Wonder Years and how Kevin Arnold narrated his childhood experience in the 60s. For those of my generation, I thought about Everybody Hates Chris and how Chris Rock highlighted his experience growing up going to an all-white school in the 80s. And for those even younger in the room, I even thought about Eddie Wong from Fresh Off the Boat narrating his experience as a Chinese American growing up in the suburbs during the 90s. So I thought maybe it's time to reclaim some space for women whose experience as young girls can just be as innocent and confusing, fun, adventurous, and complex. So this is my attempt at um, something I call Fresh Off the Hate. So to preface my story, I want to say that I am not an expert on anything other than my own lived experience. I'm not here to address the multitude of oppressions that we know exist, but just the ones that I personally have experienced, although those are all really great conversations to be had. This is also not meant to be a comprehensive retelling of my life, and so I try to share some of my story in a few short vignettes. Um, and I also want to say that although I'm talking about anti-blackness, I do not have the black American experience. I really come from a, a South Asian American perspective. And so with that said, I want to um, introduce a few important concepts that I may not mention again, but are really embedded within my story. So the first is um, when I speak to racism, I'm talking about the anti-black racism, which is a system of race prejudice plus institutional power that profits off black life by devaluing it. Uh, I'm talking about anti-black racism as a system that works to deny black people access to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and forcibly contributes to death, incarceration, and disease. I talk about navigating this anti-blackness as a South Asian member of a, um, in of a perceived uh, model minority group. 
So when I speak about um, another term, Islamophobia, I'm talking about the perception that Islam is a monolithic uh, faith that cannot adapt to the new realities in our world. I'm talking about Islam as a faith that cannot share common values with other major faiths and is violent and irrational. I'm talking about the perceptions that rationalizes the use of violence against Muslims. Lastly, I speak about sexism. I'm speaking about everything that Francesca Abbey and Ashley said, and I'm also I'm speaking about how I interface as a brown Muslim woman with a system of patriarchy that wants my body, my womb, my children, my silence for capitalistic gain. You following me? Yeah. Okay. We need a literacy moment. My friend uh, Raquel taught me about literacy moments. You can raise your hand. We'll try to make it interactive. So as Joyce mentioned, I was born in Jakarta, Bangladesh, just a few um, short years after the country gained its independence from Pakistan. Um, and it Woo! still surprises me. Yeah. <laughs> is that you, Rana? My Bengali sister in the crowd. Um, so it still surprises me today to think that my family lived through a civil war. Um, it was only in the last five years that I found out that my mom was an underground organizer for the Bangladesh Liberation Movement. You know, you find out your parents are fine. So that's kind of cool, Mom. We rarely speak of the um, trauma this has caused. However, three million people lost their lives, including my great uncle, Tajuddin Ahmed, who was the first prime minister of the country. And I appreciate my fearless Aunt Ripi, who works tirelessly to really, um, you know, ensure that the history of the country is captured from the perspective of um, Bengalis and not co-opted by Western imperial interests. So I want to honor them, and I want to honor the legacy of freedom fighters that I'm proud to be um, uh, a part of, uh, and all the enduring women in our family. As the story goes about me, in the late 1970s, my mother, older brother, and I immigrated to this country and moved to Worcester to be with my father, who was going to school at WPI for civil engineering. <clears throat> oh, and just for the record, my brother and I, we are um, 11 months apart, so we qualify to be Irish um, twins, right? <laughs> so we can really be at Park Ave together. <laughs> now, but at one point of our lives we were deemed illegal because our visas had expired. So there was definitely a cloud of fear hanging over us back then. I remember it being a time of hiding and uncertainty of, um, of what could happen. Um, so this was not something that we talked about, but we knew something was in the air. Um, so fortunately we were able to gain our permanent residency before um, ultimately securing our citizenship in the country. And so as I listen to the debate over immigration, it's crazy to see, so this is the time warp I'm taking you through. As I listen to the debate of immigration, um, it's crazy to see that the whole anti-immigrant sentiment is supported by propaganda that convinces the American public to think that undocumented immigrants are living off of public welfare, when in fact, the propaganda hides and protects the slave and low-wage labor market which continues to fuel capitalist economy. And um, you know, examples of this is privately owned detention facilities that make millions of dollars holding undocumented immigrants and children. And private companies, including farms, also reap the benefits of not having to pay equi equitable wages and benefits to undocumented workers. Um, it's also um, in this political climate that we all we see human trafficking, sex trafficking um, among undoc undocumented immigrants. So um, this is just a um, this is just a cameo of my um, of my brothers and sisters. So this is a high guy. They just showed up. We wanted to make sure I gave them a shout out. <laughs> um, so we grew up just a couple of blocks from the YWC, as, jo as Joyce mentioned. And I went to preschool in um, diverse Plumley Village. Um, and by the time I was four years old, I um, had my first race memory. And it was specifically um, about me being adamant about having white dogs. 
And so it saddens me to think of how in less than two years of living in the United States, I internalized such a strong self-hate at an early age. But sadly, this is not uncommon, nor is it just um, a thing of the past. So the doll test of the 1940s, as many of you um, may be familiar with, was conducted by um, African-American psychologists Kenneth and Mimi Clark, who studied black children's attitudes about race. And the study ultimately was used to determine what racial segregation in public schools was, um, that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. And almost all of the children readily um, attributed positive characteristics to the white dolls and not the black dolls. The Clarks concluded that prejudice and discrimination and segregation caused black children to develop a sense of inferiority and self-hate. And unfortunately, this still stands true today. So a similar study was um, recreated in 2010, where researchers, researchers asked the children, both black and white, a series of questions and had them answer by pointing to one of five cartoon pictures that varied in skin color from light to dark. The test showed that white children as a whole responded with a high rate of what research, researchers called white bias, identifying the color of their own skin with positive attributes and darker skin with negative attributes. So even the black children as a whole had some bias towards whiteness, but far less than white children. So this is different from the Clark study because this actually involves white children. Um, so in the context of anti-black racism, this implicit bias harbored, harbored by white children against black people goes unaddressed and ultimately plays out in tremendously harmful and lethal ways as those children grow older and access their institutional privileges in society. Children need real curriculum around racism, and in my experience, they have been really eager for it. So um, back to school life. So when my elementary school closed, which is um, actually where the Department of Public Health building is now, my parents were forced to find a new school outside of my neighborhood. Um, and so what would you think was the criteria for a good new school? Any guesses? Mom, you can't answer. So it was, um, it was actually the grass to pavement ratio. So the school with more greenery was deemed to be a better school. Unfortunately for my brother and I, this meant we were going to an all-white school. And that's me, the little coffee drop circle in the <laughs> So the kids there were perplexed. They didn't know what to make of us because we were one of the few Bengali families in town back then. Um, and Worcester kids back then were limited to these four racial categories, right? So you the black, Spanish, Chinese, or white. And the, that's what you were like placed in. And it kills me to this day when people say Spanish when referring to Latino people, or Chinese when referring to the Southeast Asian people. And I make it a point to, to, to correct them. And the adults would always talk about how they respected everyone, even if you were black, white, red, yellow, green, purple, blue. But I knew that they were being disingenuous when they were making up people that did not exist. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't until Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom came out years later in 1984 that our peers felt like they were more informed about us. God help us. So the racial slurs happened almost on a daily basis. My brother and I did not know how to deal, so we tried to address it using the methods we were taught how to, like talking to a grown-up. Unfortunately, the grown-ups did not know how to handle moving from desegregation to integration. And I know the schools don't think about it this way because they feel like they inherited a white population, so it's not really desegregation. But when you start introducing new populations into all white spaces, it is a, um, a form of desegregation. And um, integration, a thoughtful approach to integration is needed. So, um, you know, I told my fourth grade teacher about, you know, uh, the kids calling me the N-word and all, this, all these things. And um, he made a point to put it on my report card that I need to stop telling on people 
Instagram. This is my fourth grade teacher. I was asking my mom, Mom, can you get the report card so I can like take a picture of it and put it on the um, PowerPoint so people can see? Because it is like, you know, that is some kind of record when your teacher can't even deal with it and they tell you, don't keep talking about it. So for me to interact in a space that I felt was unsafe and did not value me felt very violent to me. Um, so I was always hiding. So you know when there's like unsafe situations, you go into hiding, and that's a violent um, space to be in. I found a way. I found ways to protect myself from these daily vicious attacks by advocating for myself, but ultimately was perceived as more outwardly aggressive for doing so. And unfortunately, this is not dissimilar to the experience um, I actually face today in predominantly white spaces. So. You know, that dynamic between a school's implicit bias, structural racism, and a student's own need for self-preservation has gone on far too long without any needed attention it deserves. So I know I'm not the only one because recent data shows um, that black girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. And with harsher penalties for the same infractions, um, and black girls are also the fastest growing group in the juvenile justice system. So something is happening there. While the rates are high for black boys, they are highest for girls. And when we don't deal with these unhealthy interfaces between the dominant structures and students um, who need uh, support and are really at their wit's end trying to preserve themselves, we ultimately criminalize the kids who are really victims in the situation. And we see this playing out publicly now in our, our own community. So the first time um, in eight years in the Worcester Public Schools, um, that it's actually reduced the out-of-school suspension rate. Um, it was reported, I think, in January. And that's less than double the state average, which is great news. But we know that we must continue to examine the disparity by race, especially for black and Latino students. jump to mosque life. We've talked about this. So growing up, my family attended mosque weekly um, when we could, but as life got busier, we became no different than many families who go to church on holidays or special occasions. That was us. As I grew older, the strongest part of my religious identity became my last name, Islam. Rather than um, for religious reasons, I claimed that not eating pork was one less meat towards becoming a vegetarian, which is what one day I aspired to, to be. Um, we, of course, did not celebrate Christmas, but my mom introduced the concept of gift giving as part of our New Year's celebration. It wasn't as cool as Christmas, but it was something in, and it had added perks for the after Christmas sales. <laughs> We made it our own. So um, this story I, I want to tell. Um, so this is the 1990. I don't know if Joyce and Carly, you might remember if you remember this. Um, but uh, President um, at the time George Bush Sr. had waged war against Iraq, um, and the media aired live missile attacks. And my um, one of my teachers decided it was a good idea to show it in the classroom. You know, it was real-time live missile attacks. Um, and anytime you bring out the TV, it stirs up so much interest and excitement from the students. Um, however, this time it did it for me. Um, because as the missiles were being launched and being captured um, by this blurred night vision camera lens, students were shouting for the killing of those students with no recourse. And I was sitting there amongst them. This stuff didn't just happen in school, but it also invaded my home. One night, someone called our house, um, and my father answered the phone and um, asked my dad why um, Muslims kill people. He had looked up Islam in the phone book and got our number. I remember experiencing And who knew that a little over a decade later that 9-11 would happen? The national response um, post 9-11 9-11 was political pandemonium. All of a sudden, there was an increased surveillance, detention centers popping up everywhere, and unprecedented funding for emergency response, and military-grade weapons for local police. 
you see how these programs, just like the war on drugs, only exacerbated issues in low-income communities of color across the country, including, including Ferguson. So when I see these harsh images, I see the products of Islamophobia interacting with anti-black racism in America. And when we're quick to jump to solutions without really putting an analysis on it, we're actually hurting the community more. So I guess, you know, at the end of um, a sitcom, you gotta wrap it up with like a nice, nice heavy bow. So I'm gonna try to do that, but we know that's not true. <laughs> Life is ongoing, it's messy. So um, many of these childhood memories certainly disrupted my life and gave me some bad days and tears to remember. I was fortunate enough um, to have had a loving mom um, who gave me spiritual guidance and support. I was fortunate to find ways of accessing information about race and racism. In fact, um, the first time I picked up the book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, like, there's a Muslim I can read about <laughs> who's part of the civil rights movement that we don't talk about. I was fortunate to have sports in a youth global perspective, in a, in a, a global perspective, which made me, um, which you know, I really, you know, being from Bangladesh and actually having the opportunity to visit there really gave me a perspective of the world being so much bigger than, than Worcester. Um, and it was really a life-changing experience, it, and it allowed me to see that there's a space for me in this world. I will say that, however, without an analysis of the core issues. Um, it could have been easy to think there was something intrinsically wrong with me in retreat. I think as women, we can all relate to that, we do that. Um, that's how um, we internalize our oppression. Um, and I think that when also we are a woman of color or, um, you know, uh, that uh, you also internalize it um, differently. For something, for someone like me um, with model minority status, a retreat could have easily been um, ignoring the problem while contributing to it at the same time. Many South Asians are, um, you know, applauded for um, creating a inroads into the medical sciences um, and into other, um, you know, esteemed careers. And that certainly, you know, um, could have been a vision for me. And certainly my parents had it and I fought, I fought them <laughs> on that. Um, and I, so I could have just turned away and said, you know what, I'm just going to live this life. Of, um, Ignorance is bliss. But I didn't take that route, thankfully. I made every effort to invest myself in developing my racial analysis through my lived experiences. This regular practice has helped me help guide me in my life and help me focus my energy towards racial justice issues. So women co-invested. I am so blessed to be among an incredibly supportive network of women in this community who are also committed to racial justice. Otherwise, it's really difficult to go at it alone. I also try to recognize that I don't share the same experiences um, and the harsher realities that some of my black and Latino colleagues um, and friends do. And sometimes for me, that means I need to take a leadership step back um, and create more space um, you know, for others um, to take a leadership role, and that's totally appropriate, and that's definitely a skill uh, that I've picked up along the way. Being fully aware of both my privileges and my oppression has led me to be continually invested in this fight no matter what role I play. So I began by recognizing where, recognizing where I came from, but I also want to recognize the legacy that was 50 years ago yesterday. Um, when hundreds of people were brutally attacked by uh, Alabama state troopers as they marched from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, um, in protest of racial discrimination and voting. Uh, the events which uh, has come to be known as Bloody Sunday led Congress to enact the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that prohibits racial discrimination with voting. Immigrants like myself stand on the shoulders of those who came before us to fight for our civil rights in this country. As President Obama said in his speech yesterday to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Selma March, he said, because of what they did, the doors of opportunity swung open, not just for African Americans, but for every American. Women marched through those doors, Latinos marched through those doors, Asian Americans and gay Americans, and Americans with disabilities came through those doors. This history should 
never be lost upon us. The brutal attacks and injustices continue to this day, and it's incumbent upon us to continue this fight and to prepare future generations to engage as well. So um, in conclusion, I just want to leave you with a poem from Lucille Clifton about um, celebrating, stepping into a newfound awareness of, um, as women um, and as women of color. Won't you celebrate with me what, have, what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge. Between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight, my other hand, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Put down the razor, a presentation on female genital cutting 
and current proposed legislation by Rep Representative Gloria Fox to decriminalize the practice of FGM in Massachusetts, a very important issue that happens in Africa and the Middle East, and so it seems to have found its way here in Massachusetts. Workshop three, five things to make 2015 your best financial year yet. So some simple household budgets and holiday shopping starting now, improving your credit score, coupons, and prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And the last workshop is workshop four, Solari Weaving. It's an improvisational contemporary art form started by a Japanese lady, Misu Zhao, in the late 1960s. It is based on the ancient set principles of spontaneity and self-discovery. So you will learn to weave today. So lots of things going on. So we'll have a break. Feel free to help.